Welcome to this, the Supply Chain Compromises Part 2, and this time we're looking at dealing with supply chain compromises. I'm your host, Steve Robson Godwin, I'm also the uh, principal author of the LDR 553 Cyber Incident Management. You do remember you had a homework. Yes, it was actually to download the third-party supply chain incident management plan from the SANS website. There is the URL just there if you need to get it. What I'm going to do in this short video is go through some of the boxes and that are in the core part of that plan. We came up with this because we wanted something that was similar to the, you remember the old PICER that we talk about on the SANS 504, preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, lessons learned. We wanted something similar to that, a simple series of structured phases that you could go through for a third party problem. The way we've structured this, you can see we start at the top there on the confirm one and we end up down as communicate. You don't have to do these in order. They're in a rough order that you may want to try to do them in. I tend to find, however, that some of them stall, some of them take more time, etc. So I end up sort of doing them almost in parallel, but they generally complete the top ones first and finish off the bottom ones last. Let's go through some of them to see what they contain. All right, first of all, con confirm the claim. If it's already in the hype in all of the press that's, that one of your suppliers is offline, you can probably take it, the fact that they're offline or they have a problem. However, you may also get rumors uh, through you know, various other people that, that a certain such a company has a problem and therefore you may need to reach out to your point of contact, your supplier's point of contact, through your legal team potentially, to get the actual confirmation, do you have a problem? What is your um, estimation of your unavailability or your impact duration? Good to get that. Uh, really out initially because you want to be able to brief the execs as to what the potential problem is and how you're going to deal with it. When you're talking to them, if you're talking to them, it's great to identify the time frame. This is because really we want to be doing, as you'll see later on in some of the stages, some investigations as to what the attackers may have done via the third party into our network. Therefore, knowing a time frame for our, our IR team to do investigations for is important. If we don't get it, they're going to start it today and start working the way back. But it's good to sort of know, are we looking back really a week, a month, six months? Is it longer? Because the longer we go back, the longer it will take us to do. And also the quality of the data that we have to look through is going to degrade. So we'll get less and less confident the further back. It's also, you know, wasting resources if they were only compromised a week ago and we end up looking through three, four months worth of, uh, of logs, etc. So it's important to get that captured. Also, however, when we're talking to them, sort of linking a little bit into the PyCERL sort of uh, framework in their identification phase. Ask them, hey, do you have any indicators of compromise? Why did you think you were compromised? Or, or why did you kick off your incident? What indicators did you have? What sort of got your spidey sense tingling, etc.? It would be good to get that information. And even if they can't tell you whether or not you're exactly affected, it's always good to get the high level sky diagram of, our, you know, attackers are over here and your data is over here and there's a lot of systems in between is still a little bit of a reassuring, even if it's not something I can definitely quote to my execs. I'd rather have some sort of general feeling like your data is in our customer area and the attackers in our corporate network. That's a little bit of reassurance that there is at least some sort of break between where they believe the attacker is and where the attacker is not. On top of time frame, however, a lot of times for organizations that have been hit with ransomware, if they only if they only detect it at the encryption event, then they didn't really detect anything. Um, and therefore, I, I commonly see with these kind of organizations when they are telling us, hey, we've just had an encryption event, we have 400 of our servers encrypted. That generally means they didn't detect the attacker in the network first, and they probably have a, a, a very low chance of being able to work out exactly where the attacker was in a matter of hours. What I tend to find is, however, that um, an organization hit with ransomware, after about a week after the encryption event, they have a bit of a feeling as to what the attacker has done on the network, maybe at the entry point, possibly patient zero. Generally, it takes them about two weeks to actually be able to say, yes, we've definitely identified patient zero. We definitely have a good structure as to what they've done or sort of good flow attack chart, etc. That said, each incident is different. And if the attacker has been able to encrypt vast quantities of the network, the, you know, the number of machines left to actually evidence what the attacker has done is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I have seen organizations who have done very quick recoveries 
at the expense of understanding anything that the attacker did. But what they simply did was when all the servers were encrypted, they went and rebuilt them all and they had no chance to understand any attacker activity. And they took that on the chin, as it were, saying it was better to be available again rather than painstakingly slowly understand what the attacker did. So it's good to, for you to be prepared for the fact sometimes when you go to the, the third party and say, you know, when will you compromise? They go, we don't know uh, and we may never know. So that is one of the key things of dealing with supply chain incidents is this information vacuum. You can't drive it, you can't direct it, and sometimes the third party will just say, we don't know, and we may never know. So what you then have to do is turn that around and say, right, let's research the relationship. Let's understand what this third party does for us and what we do for them. It's good to understand, do they have remote access? Do they have VPN access? Because when we get down into the consideration phase, we may look to disable accounts, etc. So really understanding that relationship is important. The problem you're gonna have here is that a lot of relationships aren't actually that well documented. Certainly for long-standing relationships where the organization gave you a master services agreement 15 years ago and a statement of work similarly dated 15, you know, 10 years ago, which has been only annually renewed, that master service agreement, that statement of work will have things like do administration, do support, okay? And then what they do is simply bill you, know, bill you hours you know, uh, on a monthly basis. If you're in this kind of situation, it's going to be very difficult for you to look in the documentation as to what actually has been going on. So that's why you need to reach out to the business units and say, hey, business unit X, what does this company do for you? What services do they provide? What access do they have? What data can they process or see? That's what you really start to get to understand what's going on. Similarly, understanding if you are critical to the third party or if they are critical to you. If they are critical to you, then you need to look at maybe alternate services and maybe diversifying your supply chain in the future. It doesn't help you now, but it does allow you to feed up to the execs what the potential impact is if you have a single supplier who's doing critical services for you, which are now no longer available. If, however, you are critical to them, I mean, in other words, you're a big buyer of their services, you might be able to drive sort of a bit more of the investigation with them and push them to give you more information. Again, it depends on your relationship with them and how big you are and how big they are. Next phase we're going to look at is assessing. Assessing the direct, immediate impact. Okay, are they administrators? Do they have remote access, etc.? You know, can they change data? Do they process our data on their network? Can they alter our network? Can they talk about our customers, access our customers' data? That's immediate and sort of saying, could they destroy our cloud environment? Could they add accounts to our domain controller? Could they delete our systems? That's what you're trying to assess in this immediate impact point. Could they release information about us which could be really damaging? Once you've got that, you're then going to extend it further and say, let's actually look and investigate both the current uh, uh, potential activities. In other words, take that assessment and say, do we see any evidence of this potential activity? Do we see where they've maybe added other user accounts? Then you look at indirect stuff. Have they changed configurations? Have they uh, modified boundary systems? Have they added sleeper accounts? Have they done unusual things at unusual times of the day? That's really what we're getting into. That investigation is going to start it today and work our way backwards. If we know the time frame, it'll stop about, you know, a week, two weeks, maybe after the time frame, just to be sure. Because if the third party doesn't know, dare I say it, were we the conduit that the third party got compromised from? Sometimes taking this view that, oh, we might have been hacked from the third party is wrong. Actually, the third party was hacked from us. So it's good to take that window. If you know it, add a couple of weeks on. That's your area to investigate. Once you've got all this information, then you can make a decision about this consideration to isolate them. Okay, if they're encrypted now, they can do no services for you. So you got to think, well, you know, isolating them, cutting them off, etc., blocking all the accounts, blocking the VPN, blocking their domains, blocking their emails will be an immediate protection of your organization and it's not going to impact them. But you have to think about if you do block their emails, how are you going to communicate with them? How are they going to be able to send you updates if you just block their domain? If they have a nominated third party, somebody helping them, maybe an IR company, etc., you could set up communications via the IR company, which would give you a, a cleaner, safer way of communicating with the impacted third party. All right. Then finally, you've got to consider the, the overall communication. How are we going to communicate this? How are we going to communicate this internally to our staff who work with a third party to say, hey, this entire company, they're not coming to work tomorrow. 
you know, deal with that and deal with that in the business. But also then you have to make the wider team available of this and maybe the entire company because if this company did a critical service for you, maybe hosting data, hosting services, providing some sort of input, their lack of availability might affect our availability. It may affect our customers. And we have to be very careful working with our legal teams, etc., to make sure that we don't out them if our third party is not public. And you may say, that's not fair. That's really not fair because, you know, um, you know Steve, you're saying that we can't tell our customers that we are impacted and they are impacted because of this third party's mess up. I'm like, yeah, because if it's not public, you get into a liable thing about how you're defaming them, etc., etc., and it gets really messy. So sometimes you have to be a little bit vague as to why you're having issues, even though you know exactly why you're having issues. And you have to be careful how you communicate that to both staff, you know, and members of the public and regulators, etc., etc. So there's a lot to consider. As I said before, you can do these either uh, as the, you know, in the order that I've listed them here, but you tend to do them sort of in a little bit of parallel, purely because you never know what information is going to be available. The first two at the top is external. Everything else, all the green, amber, red, you know, reds, etc., those are all internal stuff. Everything from research down is stuff you can do in that information vacuum. Anybody who tells you that there's not much work to do on a third party is overlooking all of the research, all of the understanding that you can give your organization about that third party. So while some people say, hey, I don't get many incidents and I only get a couple of third party ones, so I'm not that busy. I find third party supply chain incidents can actually be almost more um, so more busy for the incident management team because of all the assessments, understanding, the gathering of contracts, gathering of business units to understand that potential impact so you can make an appropriate risk-based decision. The difficulty with this is because it's off network, people tend to be like, yeah, it's not a big thing. It's not majorly important overlooking that access, that indirect and direct impacts that are possible. Don't be caught by that. If you like this kind of stuff, this is the kind of things that we do on the LDR 553. Um, this is a, uh, the thing we talked about there, third party supply chain is like a good chunk of the afternoon on day three. We have four exercises back to back when we look at third party notifications, look at doing the risk assessments, looking at uh, uh, handling calls, etc., and briefing execs on the output. So it's a multi-stage, nice four exercises back to back type thing. Uh, we'd love to have you on the course. And if you're interested, uh, do reach out. Otherwise, that is it for this video. Uh, next ones we're looking at coming up, a um, little bit on ChatGPT, etc., and potentially some on how to deal with ransomware. So stay tuned to the rest of the series.